Hi, welcome back to the channel. Uh, today I'm going to do something a little different. Uh, my, my goal isn't to turn the channel into a, a political statement or anything. Um, I, trust me, I could go on with politics and current events and all this other stuff, but what I really want to do is keep the channel as much as I can down to uh, writing and like some mental health issues and, and that sort of thing. But that's part of the reason why I decided to go ahead and make a, the, this walk away story is because when I look out, you know, out in the world or something, what I see represented a lot is a lot of very liberal authors and very liberal counselors. And it might be true that most counselors and certainly most social workers are actually very liberal. I don't necessarily think that's true for, for the author world. And, and also, even if it is true, I, I want the message to get out there that not all authors and counselors think alike, especially counselors. Uh, when I became a counselor, one of the things I wanted to do was be uh, the sort of counselor that like my dad would want to go see. Uh, my dad's a former vet, you know, former Vietnam vet, uh, rides motorcycles, hunts, fishes, that sort of guy. And I want that sort of guy to feel okay with going to counseling, feeling like he would he would be heard and understood. And so that's part of the reason why I decided to do this walk away video is just to sort of put that out there for whoever needs to hear it that that uh, not all authors and not all counselors think alike. My, I guess my walk away story kind of uh, begins a long time ago. <clears throat> I was I was raised Catholic. And I was a good old Catholic kid. Um, went to went to church at least once a week, sometimes twice. As a altar boy, I read the Bible. I even thought about becoming a priest. You know, went to I didn't go to Catholic school, but I went to like Catholic Sunday school, like our version of Sunday school. Um, and and that was all well and good. And and I understood there's a lot of hypocrisy. You know, in in the Christian community, you know, the Jesus teaches turn the other cheek and um, do unto others as you have them to do unto you. Uh, judge not, lest ye be judged. And yeah, if you go to church, you see a lot of judgmental people, a lot of vindictive, mean people, uh, uh, that sort of thing. A lot of corruption. But I don't know. I, I was just maybe I was young because I idealistic. I was willing to ignore that. Um, then I had a crisis of faith in college, which happens to a lot of folks. Um, and then I started, I, I left the church, started rethinking my faith, got involved in more like, you know, new age stuff and Wicca and, and actually read the satanic Bible and all this other stuff. I was very angry and that sort of thing. And so I kind of went into that realm and, and really started hanging out with a lot more like liberal people, you know, leftist types, as we might call them today. And it was great. It's part of the reason why I wanted to move to Austin was, you know, at the time, it was great. These were people who were open, who were non-judgmental, who were accepting of people who were different than them. E even even the conservative types, they, they would be more open to them in the, in the Christian types. Um, they'd be more open to those, for, more tolerant. Uh, they, they didn't fall in the superstition, you know. When I was growing up, it was still very much like if you listen to heavy metal, then you're you're going to turn to Satan. Um, uh, Dungeons and Dragons is evil. It's a tool of Satan. Um, I, I was in high school when Al Gore and his wife had the PMRC, and they're you know trying to put labels on music and censor music and uh, all that. I grew up with all the Satanic Panic stuff. I mean that stuff started in the late '60s, about the time I was born, and it really didn't end until like maybe the late 80s. So pretty much most of my early adult life was, was this whole notion of things are evil, things are bad. And you hung out with the liberal crowd and, and it felt great because they were much more, they felt more intellectual and they felt more like they understood things and, and were more tolerant and more open to like freedom of expression, freedom of speech, you know, that, that sort of thing. They weren't given to silly superstition and didn't believe things just because someone told them. And for a while, that's how it really was. I mean, I think I think for some people maybe you're, <clears throat> who are younger, who are experiencing the world today and experiencing what's online, you think, oh no, liberals are just always crazy. And I'm like, no, there there was a time where that was the rational folks. It was it was the, it was the right that was the irrational folks. I, I don't really remember the '90s too much. That was definitely more when I was much more in an intellectual space. But I was also depressed and dealing with all my own crap and. So fast forward to like the 2000 election. Um, that was George W. Bush, who was the governor of Texas at the time, which where I lived, and then Al Gore. I voted for Ralph Nader. Um, 
who I, th- I don't even remember if he's running for the Green, or I think it was just independent. But I knew George W. Bush was just more of the same, more of the Christian conservative, working for big corporations and all that stuff. I didn't know how bad he was and he was going to be until he got actually elected. And I knew Al Gore was going to be more of the same too. More Clinton policies, more scandals and all this other stuff. And I was just kind of sick of it. So reality was is when the whole 2000 election came along, I kind of didn't care because it was both of them were bad. Then 2004 came along. Um, it was George W. Bush versus um, uh, John Kerry. And I think I voted for Jill Stein. Uh, maybe I didn't even vote. I actually don't remember. You know, Because it was that sort of George W. Bush, by this point, he had lied to us to get into this Iraq war. Liberal friends knew that. Liberal friends knew that he lied, knew that the uh, mainstream media was covering for his lies. Uh, they were kind of pushing back a little bit, but not so much. Um, but it was obvious that my crowd, you know, got it, and the the right didn't. Not the Democratic Party. I was I've never really been solid with the Democratic Party, and 2004 was a good example. John Kerry was the guy who voted for the Iraq War. Then when he saw that it wasn't popular anymore and he wanted to be president, then he did the whole I was I was against it before I was for it or I voted for it before I voted against it or whatever. It was it was obvious that he he did what he thought was popular, probably more from a deep state perspective than what he thought was right, and he was, wasn't going to get my vote for it. So then flash forward to 2008, and that was Obama. And that was when I got excited again. I thought, oh, here's Obama. He's going to change things. He's the hope and change. He's going to be different. He's, he's certainly not Hillary Clinton. I don't want Hillary Clinton because I already knew she was corrupt at the time, and she had supported the Iraq War, and uh, uh, Barack Obama had said he was against it. So I enthusiastically ran out and voted for him. Big, big supporter. Me and all my friends are big supporters. And within two years, I could tell he was just George W. Bush in blackface. That, that's really all he was. Um, by that point, by 2010, you know, by halfway through his, his election, certainly by it was time for him to be reelected in, in 2012, um, he had uh, nothing about the banks that had uh, crashed the economy didn't put anyone in jail, didn't even really investigate anything. It was just sort of like a, oh, well, let's just spend a whole bunch of money, give it to these other corporations, and we'll just kind of put a Band-Aid on it. And this is where my counseling office is. But anyway, um, not only did he not get us out of the Iraq War or the Afghanistan War, he dug us in a little deeper for a little while, um, and... Then he, we started supporting the Saudi Arabians as they committed genocide against the Yemeni people. Then, um, what else did, what were we doing? Well, then, of course, there's Syria. Uh, for some reason, he wanted to drag us into Syria. That was where I knew that um, the, the media was really kind of in, in, in the fix. Which, Because when, when uh, Obama first wanted to get into Syria... I think he understood it wasn't really popular. So the way one was public support. He wanted, wanted Congress to approve it, and they didn't. They actually fa- passed a resolution saying they didn't want to go into Syria. The polls said we don't want to go into Syria. Obama did it anyway. And in my mind, that probably should have been the point in which he was, he was impeached. But, you know, the mainstream media just kind of shrugged and went, oh, well, you know, look how cool he looks. Look how nice he is when he dances. As pretty as family is, you know. Um, so 2012 came along, I, I'm very sure, yeah, that was when I, I know I voted for Jill Stein at that point, um, it was like, I'm not going to vote for Obama, uh, oh, oh, the Affordable Care Act was the other one, um, I knew that was a, a sham, I'm a counselor, I, I accept insurance, I deal with insurance companies, and I can tell you right now, any healthcare system that we come up with that is dependent upon the survival of insurance companies is doomed to fail. I'm not saying we have to get rid of insurance companies. I'm not saying that they're necessarily evil. But I'm saying that if our national health care system is built around the notion of we have to include, make sure that we include insurance companies, we have to make sure our system is dependent upon them, which is really all the Affordable Care Act is. It was a way for you to get health insurance, but that's not the same thing as health care. And 
for a while I had health insurance that I couldn't really afford and because of that I couldn't get health care. I was paying you know hundreds of dollars a month for a pre- in premiums for a high deductible insurance plan and I, I did the math one day and I realized I would have to spend ten thousand dollars over the course of a year before my shitty insurance company would kick in a single penny and that's assuming they didn't come up with a reason to not pay which you know that's what insurance companies do so it, it was obvious that, that one was was broken there's a few things about the ACA that I like that we need to preserve that we want to keep but all of that fits on one sheet of paper I think the ACA is like 1100 pages it's at least a thousand pages long so what's in all those other pages right and in my mind, any good liberal asked these questions. Well, Obama came along and he started making liberals really stupid. Uh, that's when they started falling in love with <clears throat> the politicians and politics and that sort of thing. Uh, that's when we got into the notion of you can't criticize Obama because then you're a racist. That was probably when I knew that there was something, something up, something really going on. That uh, all of a sudden the media that most of my liberal friends didn't trust were now just sort of fawning all over Obama and telling everybody, telling them my liberal friends what they wanted to hear, and they, they just ate it up hook, line, and sinker. I knew all along that Obama was an incredibly shady president. Uh, he did, if Trump has done like one tenth of the stuff that Obama has done, he would have been impeached multiple times over. But they like to say, oh, he had a scandal free presidency. Well, it was scandal-free because the press just never talked about it. It just went away. Um, and the Internet wasn't quite up to the task yet. There was still some talk and stuff. But today, most of the Internet kind of has replaced uh, mainstream media. But back then, that hadn't quite happened yet. So we get to 2016. And that was probably like the, the crux of my walk-away point at, at that point. Um, I was a Bernie Sanders supporter because I was still a good old liberal uh, I wanted Bernie to win. I knew he was outside the mainstream. I thought a lot of his ideas were really good. I thought they were what, what we needed to be talking about. I still think we need to at least be talking about them. I'm not 100% sure if they're good, but, you know, nobody's seriously talking about, like, uh, um, universal health care or public option, which is not really even talked about right now. Um, but I, I that was where I started to notice a shift in my liberal friends was that, some were Hillary Clinton supporters, and I didn't understand that because these were the same people who were against the Iraq War, and Hillary supported it rather vehemently, actually. Um, she was there right beside Obama as he was starting new wars uh, all over the place. Oh, destabilizing Libya. I forgot about that one. Open air slave markets. Thank you, Obama. Thanks, Obama. Um, and so I didn't understand why they were certain. And what was next was that they were uh, attacking me because they were saying I was a misogynist because I didn't want to, I, I was voting for Bernie Sanders. And the media was talking about the Bernie bros, how uh, Bernie Sanders has a, a white male problem that, you know, a bunch of white men support him because they hate women, that sort of thing. And, and that became a thing. And my own friends were starting to attack me for being a misogynist and, and uh, f because I hated women. I was like, no, I just hate Hillary, you know. By this time, I had voted for Jill Stein in 2012. I, I don't know what the hell they were talking about. I probably voted, at that point, I probably voted for more female candidates than they had. Um, and then the, I think the real clicker for me where things started to really shift was, and of course, all through 2016, we're hearing about how Trump is a racist, how his rallies are like white supremacist rallies, how they're super violent, and he throws out people, and you know people are getting assaulted. And I don't know, I, I didn't really pay attention then. I was more focused on the Democrat side. I think part of me believed that Trump wasn't even going to get the, uh, the uh, Republican nomination anyway, so I didn't really pay much attention. Um, but there was a, a rally, a Trump rally that they had in um, California. And what happened was is a bunch of people would like block the streets so the Trump supporters couldn't get to the rally. And then they would assault people. And you can go online and you can see videos of people being assaulted, people having eggs thrown at them. There's one guy, he's walking away, his shirt is torn, he's bleeding because a mob is like gathered around him, just punched him, just for going to a, uh, a, a Trump rally. And the way the media portrayed it was, 
oh, Bernie Sanders supporters have clashed with Trump supporters. And I looked at the crowd, and I saw a lot of, like, black and brown people. You know, some of them waving Mexican flags. They weren't waving Bernie's flags. They were waving Mexican flags. And I thought Bernie bros were all white males. I thought Bernie had a white male problem. And I just listened to the media, like, lie about Bernie. They didn't even show, like... He had, I think he was like the first one to have the really big rallies, really, not even Trump, but Bernie was one had like, you know, a rally of 10,000 people. CNN didn't want to talk about it. And again, if you go back, the Bernie bros, the Bernie supporters were the ones who were attacking CNN. They were ones attacking the mainstream media. They were attacking MSNBC because they knew that they were lying and, and we could see it. And so what I decided to do is like, well, if they're lying about Bernie, are they lying about Trump too? So I sat down, I watched on YouTube uh, unedited footage of one of Trump's you know, rallies. And I was like, I don't see any white supremacy. I don't hear any racism. There's no violence. Nobody's assaulting anyone. They'd show the crowd and I'm like, oh, look, there's plenty of black and brown people in there. I mean, if there's... If there's racism being thrown around, I would think those folks would pick up on it a lot faster than I would. You know, maybe I would be deaf to racist undertones, but certainly the the black and Hispanic people sitting in a crowd would pick up on it. And so, again, I didn't really pay that much attention to Trump. I was more into the problems of the Democratic Party, and that experience was what really turned me off from the Democrats to begin with. And so... You know, watching Hillary lie and cheat and, and, and the Democrats just rig the election for her and all the super delegates basically deciding, you know, all, all of these people don't matter. These people, you know, we, we're the ones who will tell you who the candidate should be. And so when Trump won, I laughed my ass off. I thought it was funny because I just pictured in my face all of my liberal friends. And at this point, they weren't my friends anymore. Uh, we didn't talk. Uh, they were just being horrible, nasty people. Um... I just pictured the look on their face when Donald Trump was announced as the president, and I just laughed my ass off. I, I'm at the time I felt like, oh, Bernie would have won. Looking back, I'm not really sure if that's true. I think uh, um, if, if Bernie had been the nominee in 2016, I think it would have been a very different election. I don't know if Bernie would have won, but it would have been a very different election. We would have had a lot more, I think, substantive conversations. Trump could not play Bernie the way he did Hillary because Hillary's inherently unlikable. So my view was I already knew the mainstream media had been lying to us about Trump. I knew he wasn't a horrible racist, and I also knew we have a systems in place that if he became the tyrant that everybody said he was going to be, well, we'll get rid of him. If he's that incompetent, we'll get rid of him. We, we have an impeachment process. We'll get rid of him. And I remember that whole week of the election with my clients talking with people, trying to talk them down off the ledge, and... That was how I could kind of tell there was a shift. Some people felt really good once I started kind of telling them, like, don't worry, it's just politics, nothing really changes, Trump can't really do anything that bad, that sort of thing. Some people felt really good. They felt better. They felt more relaxed. They, they, I think I was sort of countering the programming they were getting from CNN and MSNBC. Some didn't. I lost a lot of clients that week because they did not want to hear that, and that theme has just kind of kept playing on since then. Uh, the, the liberals that I used to think of as very intellectual, very open, very um, rational, have become completely unhinged. They become irrational. They are super intolerant. I have lost other clients. The moment they hear that I, I even mildly support maybe something that Trump has done, they're out the door. Now, some aren't. To their credit, they, they want to have the conversation while learn, and that's why I have a lot of, a lot of hope for the future. But there is, a, there is a, a, a group that they are now the church ladies of the 80s that they preach about uh, uh, the patriarchy and, and uh, systemic racism and um, all, all of these sort of issues, these political correct leftist issues. They don't know what they're talking about. Uh, I will push back on some of these ideas, and they will, they'll even just say, well, I, I haven't really thought about it. And I'm like, so you feel very strongly about something you know nothing about. That's exactly what I used to get from the religious right. They felt very strongly about the evils of homosexuality, but they never met a gay person. 
and they didn't know anything about, or they feel really strongly about how you know bad Dungeons and Dragons is is, is on, on the youth, and they've never played the game, they don't know anything about it, and that sort of thing. But someone told them it's bad, and, and they're going with it. And the last thing they want to hear is, you know, information that goes against their views, and that's from my experience. At least the loudest portion of the left today. I don't. I still. Maybe I'm naive. I still don't want to believe everybody on the left is like this. Um, I, I've had good debates with with some kinds. I'm still seeing uh, that we we kind of go back and forth and, and that sort of thing. Um, but since since 2016, since 2018, over the past few years, I come around. I'm now a Trump supporter. For me, the big things, and you'll probably know this as being a theme is the, the economy and wars. Uh, we have had a record-breaking economy. I am 50 years old, and we have had the best economy in my entire lifetime. Think about that. I, I've had to wait until my middle age to actually have a really good economy that seems to work for everybody. And it's basically because we just have an America first mentality. And it's not like the old America first, where it's like America only, which I think was kind of how the old version was, but it's just America first. Like, our politicians should be putting forth the best interest of our country and our, our citizens before all others. And we should expect Mexico to do the same thing. And Canada, Russia, China, Brazil, Guam, don't care. They all need to uh, take into consideration their own people first and then see if they can make a deal with, you know, other people and that sort of thing. Uh, for pretty much my whole life, certainly since the 90s, since 1992 with Bill Clinton, we have not had that that, that view. It's been very much, uh, um, you know, America second. Um, usually what it is is politicians first. Who, whichever politician get themselves rich, you know. So, so Trump has made an America first policy. And also Trump has been... Uh, the first president to, in the past four years, hasn't drug us into any new wars. Now, he still has kept us. We still have people in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and he has been trying to pull them out. I don't really know what the holdup is. I thought he was the commander-in-chief, and I thought he should just be able to pull them out anyway. But um, at least he, he's he's trying. We're not really starting any new wars. If Hillary Clinton was president instead of Donald Trump... We, we would probably be in, you know, the third year of our ground war in Syria. And that's probably what the election would be about right now is the Syrian war, uh, as well as the, the, you know, dragging economy, the recession, the never-ending recession. Um, but under Trump, we're not talking about that. Instead, we are seeing peace treaties signed. And I was shocked in, when someone pointed out that the treaty between Israel and the UAE, I believe was the first one, that was... Um, the first time that America has brokered a peace deal uh, in 27 years. And I had to think about it, and I was like, 27 years? I'm 50. That means I was 23. It means I was graduating from college. I mean, some of my clients weren't even born. Some of my colleagues were like in elementary school the last time America brokered a peace treaty. That's how much of a warmongering country we've been throughout half of my lifetime or more um and under donald trump it's the opposite you know things are getting better on the korean peninsula uh they're not great uh we're not starting any new wars we're starting some trade wars but you know we kind of needed those we've been in an economic war with china for for decades uh just we're we weren't fighting it um so yeah to me that's that's where i'm at and that's why i walk away the the uh the liberals and the Democratic Party are now they're basically the new Republicans. They're the Republicans of the 80s and 90s that I remember. And I didn't like them then. And at 50, I still don't like them. Um, I don't like the intolerance. I don't like the bigotry. I don't like the assaults. Um, the only real difference I see between the left of today and the religious right of back then was the, the media support. When I was growing up, the media still basically pretty much made fun of the religious right through movies, through TV shows, through through uh, um, uh, media programs. It was always kind of like eh, these these goofy little you know church ladies, and they're so boring and they're so uptight and stuff like that. 
Today, the only difference I see is that the media embraces the left. This is their movement, and so they are using their propaganda tools to make it seem like everybody thinks this way, and you're a horrible person if you don't agree with them. Uh, the reality is, and I think we're going to, I think, we're going to find out on Election Day 2020 that, um, no, actually, most people don't agree with that. I still believe, again, maybe I'm optimistic, maybe I'm naive, I still believe that inherently Americans are libertarians. Inherently, Americans want to be left alone, and they want to leave other people alone. They don't like religious bigotry, and they don't like secular bigotry. They don't like... Um, People coming in and telling people how they should live uh, because we all inherently know that if you do it to that group, you'll do it to me eventually. Uh, and it always comes around. It always happens that way. So anyway, um, if this is like your new first time finding my video for some reason, hope you enjoyed it. Most of my video is really about like writing, um, a little bit of mental health concepts, a little bit like about creativity. I talk a little bit about my books. Uh, I put the links in, in the uh, description here. But anyway, I will hope to see you next time. Bye.